Thank you. Afternoon, all. Um, so I'm here to talk about chickens, uh, potentially, or more to the point of affordance. Um, so uh, hopefully I won't be too long because it's string snacks. Um, so affordance, why am I talking about affordance? Well, this was a subject of my um, PhD. So I've spent a lot of time reading and learning about affordance. And I think I've got a different take on it, which will be useful to share. And I'm interested in hearing other people's ideas and uh, thoughts on it. Um, and why chickens will come to that. Um, so what am I? I work for UCL as Faculty of Learning Technology lead. Um, what is that role? We'll actually be talking about that tomorrow in a session just after lunch, me and two other Faculty of Learning Technology leads from UCL. So uh, just plug in my own session tomorrow as well. Um, so I'm sure you know about affordance. I mean, affordance is a term we all use in, in ed tech, and it's a term that's used across multiple fields. I mean, that's part of the problem. It's been picked up in multiple fields, ed tech, um, robotics, HCI, and so on and so forth. So it, it's kind of lost its power a bit. And I think people want me to come today to sort of, well, give, here's another idea of what affordance might be. I mean, this is Gibson's original concept. And you know, so hopefully you know where it comes from. Gibson, I said, denying the um, uh, visual, well, ecolog ecological approach to visual perception. And he invented the term, and it does have some precedent, but he basically coined this new idea. And what's key to me is my little diagram there is it, it, it locates affordance in space. It locates affordance between people and the world. It's not an object thing. It's not a person thing. It's located in the relationship we have with our environment. Okay, this has come from ecological psychology. It's an ecological concept. Um, so he coined this, this really good idea. Now, you might well know that Don Norman, who Gibson knew, and, and they were, you know, were buddies, they did argue and fall out about this, but Don Norman took the idea and he used it in his book, The Psychology of Everyday Things, or The Design of Everyday Things. Norman was interested in design. He was interested in objects, cups and things, and tables and chairs. And so he was looking at how the actual object, the properties of an object could be used. And Norman did realize that he kind of messed Gibson's idea up a bit. I mean, eventually he tried to reframe it as perceived affordances to try and clarify that's a different type of concept. Um, but it seemed to stick. And years have gone by, and McGreer and Ho and others, and lots of other people have written more on affordance as the years have gone. Um, and they tried to have this paper clarifying and evolving a concept. And I think they did move it a little bit back towards the human, uh, but it still remains fundamentally, to my mind, something locked in an object and the actions you can have on an object. In fact, this line action possibility is kind of where I'm headed here, this unusual idea of an, an action possibility. Uh, and then there's a famous paper from Hermann Oliver from um, IOE, you might know Martin's work. He wrote 2005, The Problem with Affordance. And I think he pretty much buried it in that paper. As he said, it's too ambiguous. It's not very really useful. We use the term, but often I read some papers this morning as I get regular digests on affordance, and no one defines the term. We just throw it in, and then we don't really know what we're talking about. Um, so I think he was right in this way, that it had become a little too um, ambiguous to be useful. But... Going back to this idea of action possibilities. Um, see, no, no, Oliver talks about, Martin Oliver talks about action possibilities in his 2005 paper, this Gibson's notion of an action possibility. It's in Interaction Design Foundation, it's in Collins Dictionary, it's the definition of affordance. Many people seem to think affordance and action possibilities are the same thing. Um, it's not. I've read pretty much everything Gibson ever wrote on this, I think, and pretty much everything else ever wrote on this. Gibson never mentions this. It's not something he ever talks about, action possibilities. It's not something, a concept that's in affordance. So I don't know where this is drifted into the conversation, but if you look in the literature, it's often um, what you'll see talked about when it comes to affordance. I mean, taking my chicken again, I'm back to my chicken and, and, and the road. I mean, what's the action possibilities of a chicken? Gibson talks about in ecological terms. He talks about being frozen in a blizzard and being burnt in a fire. You know, are these action possibilities? Can I choose to get frozen in a blizzard? Because is the road flat enough and hard enough to support the chicken's weight? And that's the action is then walking. It doesn't make sense in the concept of why a chicken crosses the road. There's no affordance there that, that's kind of coming out of Gibson's theory. So going back to Gibson again, and this is when I read more deeply into what Gibson was on about, it, I think what surfaces and what we've lost in terms of affordance, what we need to go back to is intention, is needs. We all exist in this room now with a certain concept of what we want to do, what we're going to do next, why we came here in the first place, whether or not the drink's going to be cold, uh, whether this guy's going to stop going on about affordance theory. You know, we all have our 
we're not in a bubble. We have intentions and needs, and we're all different in kind of what, we, what we're thinking of too. And Gibson appreciated this. You know, he said, the, all the affordances are there, but what you attend to is based on need or what you intend to do next. And, you know, we can demonstrate with the chair. A classic example is the chair. So if I'm tired, I can pull up one of these chairs and I can sit down. The affordance is there because it links my need with my tiredness. If I want to reach something high up and I want to fiddle with this camera, okay, I can climb on it. It's strong. It's got my weight. I can light enough so I can move it. You know, it's a new affordance. And maybe there's a fire. I can smash a window and I'm not sure I want to jump out. Well, no, I didn't realize I'd be on the first floor. But for me, what I'm getting to now is this idea of the transaction. Um, it's not what we can act on that's what matters, it's the transaction that matters. And it's this concept of transaction possibilities. So I'm trying to coin a new term for affordance, which is transaction possibilities as opposed to action possibilities. I think as educators, we're more interested in transaction. So my little diagram here, what I'm trying to show is my little man is staring forward in time. Um, and on the left-hand side, you see the actions. It's a snapshot moment. You can take an action. That's the action possibilities idea of affordance. Not very useful. Interaction. Well, you can see where the HDI guys are, are interested in the concept, how it's useful, because you, know, you want to turn a knob or pull a lever or switch and things. It's an interaction over time. So you're interested in how you can interact with it. But personally, I think we're much more interested in this right-hand side of transaction possibilities. What you're interested in is what you're going to get back from interacting with an object, not actually, you know, what you can do to it, but what you're going to give you as educators. This is what I think is most important. And this idea of transaction, you know, it's not new. Um, Juby was writing about this in Education Experience back in 38. You know, it's transaction, it's to his mind. Um, the pinnacles of kind of education is he had a, a trio in his last paper about action, interaction, and transaction. Transaction being the highest thing we, we, we're aiming for as educators. And like I say, in my, in my quote, it's like, what will happen while I do this? This is what we're interested in uh, as educators. Okay, so what does all this mean in terms of practical stuff? What can, why is this useful? Why is this, why is this handy? Well, um, well, this came out of some work on authentic assessment. We had a GIST funded project I was working on at the time, and we were looking at designing authentic assessment models. And I don't want to talk about that now. Uh, but authentic assessment, if you haven't tried, is difficult to, to pull off. It's challenging the multiple dimensions. And we thought, well, I tell you what, can we use technologies, digital technologies to support these complicated authentic assessments? So they had dimensions of time, collaboration, and uh, audience and things. So we thought, I know, can we rate, using this idea of transaction possibilities, the affordance of off-the-shelf text? You know, something like Blogger, it's very good at time, actually, because it's chronological. It can scaffold and support that kind of, that dimension of authentic assessment. Skype is very good at collaboration. It can support that dimension. So we, we're trying to match technology through to effectively pedagogy design and authentic assessment design. And I was thinking to myself, well, what we have here potentially is a methodology. I've got a framework for authentic assessment in this case. I've dimensionalized it to try and tease out the key elements of authentic assessment. And now I can rate technologies based on my criteria for, for the transaction possibilities in this context that define need, again, go back to the idea of need again, um, and, and actually get a number rating. So that's what was the first thing we did was authentic assessment. I then tried this technique with the UK teaching standards. I'm a qualified physics teacher, so I, I worked with schools for a while before COVID. And, and I did the same. So we have a Poplar, Kahoot, Quizlet. And again, you're taking, if you're not in the teacher standards, there's eight different style standards. I took six of them out, the key six ones. And again, you can rate how well Poplar supports investigating, how well Ed Puzzle supports motivating, the key things you need to do as a teacher using this technique of identifying need with a model like this, which is what you have to do as a teacher, and then rating each technology against these, these dimensions. Now, finally, I'm here at UCL now. Um, and of course, UCL is home of the conversation framework, um, down at Lower Arles conversation framework and the ABC learning methodology, if you haven't come across that. Um, so Dana Lower Arles, she, Professor Lower Arles, she def created this conversation framework and she has it within it six learning styles, or learning types, I should say, not styles, sorry. Uh, and so what we're now working on, what I'm kind of fiddling with, um, is can we do the same thing with this? There are six learning, well, 
uh, types, discussing, collaborating, acquiring. And again, these are the Moodle activities and resources. So we look at Moodle, we're saying, okay, you've got your database activity. How can I rate that in the context of the conversational framework using this idea of affordances, transaction possibilities? And I can actually get cards. These are, I've got physical packs of these actually in my bag, which we, we did use to use these in face to face bits before COVID hit and that kind of. So now they're all digital. Uh, but again, I'm trying to quantify using a semi-rigorous technique um, the affordance of specific technologies given a pedagogical context. So that's my presentation. So I call this thing the app methodology for the alignment of pedagogy and technology. And it's relatively straightforward. Say so theoretical framework, dimensionalize it with critical aspects, and then you can actually rate the affordances using a keyword-based approach. But I won't go into that because I haven't got masses of time. No, I have sprinted through that a bit faster than I thought. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, why did the chicken cross the road on that name? Well, again, it's for me, it's about need. You know, chicken's hungry. What's to go and get some chicken feed? So, it's all about need. And of course, thank you. So, any questions? Um, they're digitally they're online, digitally physical packs. I've got some with me and things. Yeah, for only the teachers' standards, I've got physical packs of them. Uh, but the, the other cars are online. I mean, the ABC stuff is relatively new. We haven't done a lot of work on that yet, uh, but that, that's the plan. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The chicken cross the yes, no, absolutely. There's an affordance. Now, yeah, you're right. The affordance, you need to have an affordance on the road of, of locomotion. But I think the problem is the need thing gets dropped out of the equation because the chicken doesn't just walk across the road because the road's there. There needs to be. Um, so, no, if it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the transaction possibilities approach from that perspective is the, is the ability to support its weight. But it's I'm, I, what I'm trying to get to, I guess, is the way from that action possibilities idea. That action possibilities tends to locus more in the idea of an object as distinct and having an affordance irrespective of what I'm trying to do. Whereas this is trying to bring it more back on the learner and think, well, what is the learner trying to do in this context? And therefore, which of the affordances available will be most relevant to their needs? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have to kind of. Yeah, absolutely. We just start focusing in, isn't it? I mean, the ABC, if you don't know ABC framework, is a very physical activity with pieces of paper and cards. And the idea of these things is to throw a pack of digital cards in as well after you've done the learning design and then think, oh, which are the best tools to support, you know, in this context. But I've done this for all the Moodle tools and the database it throws out in the end was fascinating because it reveals stuff about the technologies I didn't do. It said Moodle is pretty rubbish at collaboration. We think, well, does anyone, is that rocket science? We kind of knew that, didn't we? The Moodle is not a great collaborative space. That's why we have other spaces like Zoom and Teams and the rest of it. Um, but it came up with numbers to show that. And then it showed database was great at doing assignments. And I was like, wow, that's cool, because I know some of my academics doing assignments with databases and it's working really well. And I didn't expect that to happen. So it was an interesting experiment to do this. Yeah, yeah that's what I said to you, which is really interesting, because right when you have your cards and then there's scribbles on the back of yeah. you know, yeah. yeah it surfaces things you didn't expect yeah. Mm. Yeah. okay so uh let us thank uh, our two speakers okay so uh,